resentful <laughs> was, was more the word, because I would have been quite prepared to have left school you know, as early as I could, because I wanted to get out into the world like most kids did at that time. Uh, but the law was changed, you know, and you couldn't leave until you were 14. Uh, I forget what day that came about. But it meant that my older brothers were very insistent that I stay at school as long as I possibly could. I was forced to stay at school, you know, by my family. Um, well, as you know, the school started in 1905, I think it was. Uh, it started as a co-educational school. And the first principals and the first board you know, who uh, set it up were very, very uh, intent that it was going to be uh, a broadly based school you know, with liberal you know, curriculum. Uh, I assume, I think it must have been true, it was the only school in Wellington, only secondary school in Wellington, that did not have uh, corporal punishment you know, from the very beginning. Now, the odd teacher might have hit the odd kid, but the policy was absolutely no corporal punishment you know, at all. And from the very beginning, they, um, the board and the staff uh, stressed what we would call today the humanities. You know, they had plays, you know, they had uh, musicals and everything else. What we didn't have at that time was um, sports grounds. You know, <laughs> we just didn't have anything at all. Um, but you mentioned that it was co-ed. Yes, it was. But we were kept, the boys were kept as far away as possible from every girl you know, in the school, as you can imagine. So when you came toward the school, there was a great big uh, stairway going up into the school. We weren't allowed to use it. We had to go into two side entrances through the basement. Girls on the left, boys on the right. Uh, the girls were mostly in separate classes. Uh, and uh, we would meet, you know, during um, the uh, the breaks, you know, the morning breaks and lunch break. Uh, we would meet them. We girls also going home from school, you know, because they couldn't stop us going home from school with girls. But in a sense, it wasn't really what we would call a, a co-educational school today. But it was still miles ahead, you know, of, you know many other schools. Um, it wasn't until I was in the fifth and sixth forms when the number of students had declined you know, quite a bit because as soon as the kids got to the stage where they could leave school, they left and got work. That was also during the war, so there were plenty of jobs you know, available. But when the, uh, the number of students in the upper classes declined, you know, that meant they had to uh, combine them for things like English and history and geography. The main, the main uh, course for girls was what was called commercial, and that was shorthand typing and commercial practice. That's exactly right. Uh, for boys, uh, I had no choice as to which course I was taking because my mother and father determined that. But I was in what was called an engineering pass, and we had uh, woodwork and metalwork, you know, as the practical uh, classes. But all the rest were the um, same as you would have got anywhere. There were maths, you know, physics, uh, chemistry. We had no history, but we had what was called economics, which was the same thing as what you would have called current affairs, you know, today, I'd imagine. And by the time I was in the sixth form, uh, the subjects I was taking were exactly the same as any secondary school in the country, and I got uh, I passed the university entrance in the sixth form uh, on um, physics, English, and mathematics. So, in a sense, it, it was a, a general curriculum, you know, with some stress, you know, on uh, uh, on trade schools. I was no good at any of the trade schools. <laughs> Uh, but it was interesting work to do. You, you could take French, uh, but I was never, my parents didn't want me to take uh, any language, so I didn't take French. 
they were murderers. You know, we had similarly every day. <laughs> uh, and I hated it uh, all. There were about 1,300 students there when I was there. And we went into this, what I thought was a huge assembly hall. Today it doesn't look quite as big. Uh, and we had uh, rousing songs and... Uh, then the principal was a man named Riddling, and he was a serious Christian. Uh, he was a World War I veteran uh, with a very good war record, uh, and he preached to us, and we had a prayer you know, every morning. And then he would read something uh, like uh, an extract from the Bible, uh, St. Paul, you know, uh, his letter to the Corinthians or something like that. Uh, we were also, also taught in that assembly uh, rousing pieces from Handel, the Messiah, you know, and uh, things like that. It was a total waste of time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>
the school life at all. Uh, and I have no regrets about that either, you know, because Wellington College became uh, preeminent in things like, uh, you know, cricket and rugby. And, and there, again, um, they showed their own narrowness by refusing to allow games like soccer. You know, soccer was equally, you know, lower class. And, uh, but no, there was no emphasis at all when I was there on sports. At the very end of my time there, there was an air training corps uh, cadet group, um, and I joined that for one uh, term in my last, but it wasn't a big deal, it was uh, just something you did if you felt interested in. They were. Um, as I said, they were mostly older uh, people. Uh, and I mentioned that the director when I was there was a man named Ridley. And <coughs> as I said, he had a, a war record, but he also was a pacifist of some sort. And in Wellington, there was a very well known, I think he was a Presbyterian uh, pacifist minister named Ormond Burton. And he spoke during the war against the war uh, and they arrested the authorities arrested him they put him in Mount Crawford prison uh, and for a year the prison treated him actually very well they gave him the library to look after <laughs> so he spent the year looking after the library but when he came back into civilian life his church refused to let him be a minister yeah, and this was a, a terrible thing. They should never have done this at all. And he needed a job. He simply so um, the uh, the director Ridley uh, appointed him as a gardener at Wellington Technical College. And then uh, a year after he was appointed. They were so short of teachers that he had a degree, he had divinity degrees, and he had academic degrees. And so he, Riddling appointed him as a teacher. Uh, he, he became one of my teachers. Uh, then uh, the shortage of teachers was so great, he was appointed head of the high school. <laughs> so he went from uh, Presbyterian minister to prisoner to gardener to junior teacher, you know, to uh, head of the high school in a period of about four years. He was a very fine person. You know, I thoroughly enjoyed being taught by him. I never liked Riddling here you know, very much because we never ever saw anything of him. He was just you know, a distant figure. Uh, but Orman Burton was very, very human you know, and a very fine person. Uh, he taught me English. Yes, there were. Uh, my again, mostly it was English teachers. Uh, in my fourth form, there was a um, a Miss Wilson. Uh, I don't particularly want to use a word like refined, but elegant. <laughs> she was very well dressed, very well uh, spoken, and she later went on to be head of uh, one of the East Girls College that we had in the fourth form. And the and I enjoyed you know, her classes very much. Uh, I also was possibly one of the best read students in the class as well, so she appreciated that. But I remember particularly when the film Gone with the Wind came to Wellington, and uh, she asked in class one day how many of us had seen the film and four of us put our hands up and she wanted to get our opinion of the film and in particular she asked me which character I like best now I need to interrupt this a little bit I've, re I've read Gone with the Wind since then Margaret Mitchell <laughs> and, and her recent book as well uh, and I was older when I read it, you know, in my 20s. 
and I took a completely different view uh, of what she was writing about than the film presented. And but at the age of 14 or 15, I immediately said, Rip Butler. <laughs> and the look of disappointment on her face <laughs> was absolutely um, you know, clear cut. She was to totally disappointed. Uh, but She was expecting you to say Ashley Wilkes. She was. <laughs> uh, she thought I would be much more sensitive to, yeah, than that. Uh, even today, I wouldn't say actually, it was absolutely not. I didn't like any of them <laughs> at the time I finished reading the book. Um, but she was an interesting person. Uh, she opened up all sorts of ideas you know, to us. Um, for me, it had, as a as a teacher, um, I enjoyed being a teacher there. It was very hard because when you're uh, preparing lessons every day and you've never done this before and you're trying to interest people in learning and it could be very difficult. Uh, so as a teacher, you know, I was looking at it in a completely different way. But uh, in one sense, no, two instances struck me. Uh, I was in the playground at one stage after I'd been there for about six months and one of the students in one of my classes came up to me and just, you know, casually and he said, are you English? And I said, no, I was born in Palmerston North. Why do you ask? And he said, the words you use. And I hadn't realized that the words I use you know, are the words that a journalist would use or an adult would use. Uh, and they probably only picked up maybe three or four words. And it was important you know, for me you know, to have that because I had to adjust my language. That's what he thought you know, was English. And the other instance was I was in the corridor and there were 1,300 or 1,400 students. And it's a massive um, bunch of people you know, going through the corridor. And one tall boy next to me was swearing fiercely you know, at somebody else. And I tapped him on the shoulder as a teacher. I said, hey, you wouldn't speak like that at home. And he just looked at me blankly. He would. Mm. Um, and I had, again, you know, to understand much more about the homes that they came from. Um, not quite in my mind, but I can give, I think, an answer to that. Um, his parents were Russian Jews. I think, from memory, that they got out of Russia in the early years of the 20th century. Uh, there were various pogroms and attacks on Jews at that time. Uh, and they left I think from Odessa, and they went to Edinburgh, they came to New Zealand, and I'm not too sure where uh, Max, I think his original name was Marcus, you know, but he was called Max, uh, was born, but his, all his formative years were in New Zealand. But of course he came from that tremendous Jewish background of persecution, you know, that had lasted so long. And then, of course, you get the uh, the war years and everything that happened then. Uh, he was a tremendously vital person, I'm sure that everybody you've spoken to uh, mentioned that. Great energy. Uh, ideas flew around in his head and went <laughs> absolutely everywhere. Uh, he never taught me, uh, but he taught my wife. Yeah, and uh, she persuaded me to come along to one of his classes at one time. Uh, and he was an enthusiast, you know, in the pure sense of the word. Uh, and everything that he became interested in, he was able 
in a general way to interest everybody else in, you know, as well. Uh, so he was like a, a force of nature, you know, in many senses. And many people uh, were tremendously impressed. So was I, but to an extent. Because I actually don't believe that we need um, such, uh, if I can use this word, such extravagant teachers, you know, because he could overwhelm everybody rather than inspire you know, everybody to learn you know, on their own. Yeah, that was a big thing for him. I think he went to Illinois, you know, and he, and he got a lot of uh, uh, experience, and he, he brought it back to New Zealand. He wasn't altogether welcomed in doing that because it was a new idea, and the education department you know, was very slow to uh, to pick it up. But, but that was part of his um, his background as well. You know, he he always knew that he was going to be out in front somewhere, <laughs> getting shot at. Um, but no, he was a fine person, uh, but he's not my ideal of a, of a teacher. Yeah. When I went back to, uh, when I became a teacher, uh, English was obviously you know, one of my main subjects, uh, and history, uh, and current affairs. I don't think I ever taught any, I don't think they ever asked me to teach, you know, to try to teach some other subjects, you know, that I just didn't have any uh, experience of, but they were the main ones. Not at first, because I really didn't know how to teach, you know, uh, you learn about <laughs> teaching by all the mistakes that you make, as, as you can probably imagine. Um, it took me at least you know, three years you know, to understand what I ought to be doing. Um, and then I went away into the country for two years. I had to do what they call country service. And I came back. And that was 1960. And that was the time that the Wellington Technical College was being divided into two and the Wellington Polytechnic was being set up. Uh, I had no obvious part of the polytechnic and I was going to stay in the in the high school um, but the new principal who was appointed um, was such an, an antithesis you know, to the types of principals we've had in the past. His name was Noel N-O-A-L-L Colin Noel and he wanted to make Wellington Technical College called now Wellington High School into the best academic school you know, in Wellington. He didn't want to take in students from schools like Newtown Primary School you know, who were just uh, obviously low class kids who didn't have high IQs. And uh, he just about destroyed you know, everything that the school was and that was when I quit. And uh, when the principal the director of the Wellington Polytechnic knew that I was going to leave. Uh, he didn't speak to me before. It was only after he knew I was going to leave. He offered me the job as head of what was called the General Studies Department you know, at the Polytechnic, which gave me a tremendous amount of scope, and I was quite happy to do that. I mean, it was being talked about, you know, in the uh, school for a year, you know, before the thing happened. Uh, and the principal, or the director of the uh, Wellington Technical College, was a man who was very interested in the in the theatre in Wellington, named Donald Priestley. Uh, one of his daughters uh, is Jenny Patrick, you know, who writes you know, a lot of books now on all manner of things. Uh, he asked me, because I'd been a journalist, you know, if I would um, put the book together. I didn't look at any other school history because I didn't want to write any other school history. And 
that's what, why I made it short, you know, and I concentrated on the things that made the school distinctive. Uh, I got a whole lot of uh, old minutes, you know, of the early meetings of the high school, uh, and I found as many references that I could. And then, over Christmas, 1960, 61, I went home, I was living in Kelvin at the time, got my typewriter out, and for a month I put the thing together. And I had two kids and a wife, and it was, uh, it was quite a hectic time. But that was a real, I did it in a month, yeah, and uh, there was no censorship of any sort, no one asked me to put this in or put this out, leave this out. I didn't include lists of all the teachers or all the students or anything like that. In other words, it's not like, you know, the, the other book. <laughs>
you know, the data, you know, the, the early material. And that's why Max actually suggested it should be called the School of Writing Development. In 1886, the School of Design you know, was established on the basis of Raleigh, and he was a design teacher. And he worked for the uh, Wellington Education Board, teaching student teachers you know, the, um, uh, the art curriculum, virtually, of schools. Uh, but he then said to the Education Board, what about I start some part-time classes, you know, for members of the general public. Literally, that's how it all began. And they increased, increased, increased. And then, as you'll see in the in the book, uh, he went to England in 19, sorry, 1898, I think it was. Uh, and he saw what was being done there. He came back, wrote a very, very fine report, you know, on what he thought should happen at, at school. Uh, the education department dumped it in a waste paper basket, you know, but it was other things that finally led, you know, to the establishment of uh, a co-educational secondary school from that. But it's the School of Design that began in 1986, you know, that is the origin. In 1986, you know, that is the origin. The, both institutions, the Wellington Polytechnic had night school, you know, part-time classes, as did the um, uh, the high school. And then I think about 1963-64, almost all of the, uh, or most of the, uh, the general classes taught by the Polytechnic were handed over to the high school and they built up the high, the high school classes.